Good morning. Yesterday, Oil Change Ministry blessed 48 people by changing their oil and their filters on their cars <laughs> at no expense to them, and that's because of your generosity to support that ministry. We're really thrilled about that and uh, uh, grateful for it. Also, uh, just wanted to, before I get started this morning, uh, make a, a brief service announcement. There has been uh, some emails that look like they have gone out from me that are asking people to respond to an emergency of which I am aware and purchase gift cards and then send that information back. Uh, please know I will never send you an emergency email asking for a gift card. Uh, we have a, a system of benevolence ministries in the church that maintain the highest levels of integrity and make sure and so I, I want to be a blessing to lots of people. I don't want to be a blessing to criminals somewhere else in the world. So, uh, so if you ever have a question about uh, something that was sent to you like that, you can always call the church office. We'll always give you a heads up. But I don't call asking for you to send me uh, pictures of gift cards that you purchased and scratch the numbers off of. So, all right, enough of that. Uh, our concept uh, these days is because we are going wider in our facility, we want to go deeper in our faith. So we picked out a couple of message series that we're focusing on, and the one right now is on worship. How do we grow deeper in our understanding of who God is and how we respond to him? And there's just two verses I want to focus on today. They're found in Romans, the 12th chapter, and they're written by the Apostle Paul. And he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your, what's the next word? Bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So you don't have to answer the question, just think about it. How patient a person do you think you are? Um, some of us don't consider ourselves very patient. Others of us might think we're a little more patient. I think every one of us are capable of demonstrating higher levels of patience than even we think is possible. And it's based on two questions. There's two questions that will kind of drive our capacity for patience upward. And the first question is this. What are you waiting for? Like that makes a difference. For example, uh, I have been in situations where I was attempting to call a company to resolve an issue or to access some support or something like that, and I'm put on hold. Has that happened to anyone besides me? It could just be me. And then they will play music in the background, which may or not be something that I enjoy, which is interrupted by the following kinds of statements. We appreciate and value your call. It will be received in the order in which it came in. We thank you for your patience. And depending on how important the issue is to me that I'm trying to resolve, will determine how long I stay on hold. And if it's not important at all, I tap out pretty quickly on that. We'll, we'll hang up after a, a few minutes. If you're going through a drive through have you ever had this happen? You go through a drive through and you get to the speaker where you give the order, there's no cars in front of you, you drive up and, and, and you wait for the person to say, may I take your order, please? And they don't, they don't say it. And so you just wait, you wait. How long does it take you before you go, <clears throat> excuse me? And, and then, and if still no one answers, how long do you wait? That's interesting. How long would you wait to find out the results of a biopsy? How long would you wait if a legal firm contacted you and said, I need to put you in touch with a person who will help you know how to access an inheritance you've received? See, our patience is improved if we value what we're waiting to receive. Less value, less patience. More value, more patience. The other thing that will, that the second question that determines how much patience we have is, who are we waiting with? What are we waiting for? Who are we waiting with? 
And if what you're waiting for is not that at all important, who you're waiting with might move your patient's needle in the upward direction. Let's suppose, for example, uh, that you are, are waiting and lying for ice cream. I will wait longer for ice cream, that's fact. So I'm in a line for ice cream, and then I turn around and I notice that there's someone standing behind me. They, they're trying not to be recognized. They've got eye, sunglasses on and a cap down over their head. But let's suppose it's somebody like, oh, I don't know, Taylor Swift or Beyonce or, or Justin Timberlake, Bruno Mars, uh, Hugh Jackman, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, Kevin Durant, somebody like that. And let's suppose you, you look over, oh my goodness, that's Kevin Durant. And then you just kind of stand there. And let's suppose he taps you on the shoulder. Excuse me. And you go, yeah. And he goes, first time at this ice cream place. So first of all, is the ice cream any good? And secondly, do you have a recommendation? Like, what's your favorite? Uh, how many of you would go, just leave me alone? <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we all of a sudden are filled with social graces and, and, and more... Even more important than that, let's suppose that the, the, the person engaged in a conversation with you, like after you told them your favorite ice cream, you said, oh, that's really cool. I got a friend. That's their favorite ice cream, too. And you start talking, and then the person looks at you and goes, you know, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I wouldn't mind us exchanging text numbers and just staying in touch. This has been a real delight. Would you look at that very famous celebrity and go, you're such a creeper. I don't... I'm not giving my text number out to who are you? It just you wouldn't do it. Oh, you'd give them the number, you, you'd receive their number, you, you wouldn't think twice about it. And not only would you be patient for whatever it is you're waiting for, you would actually start hoping the line goes slower because of who you're waiting with. What are you waiting for? Who are you waiting with? Higher value? Higher patience. Lower value, lower patience. You see, how we value something, it actually begins to determine our response to something. What we see worth in shapes our response. That's literally the meaning of the word worship. It comes from two words, worth, shape. The more I think something is worthwhile or worthy, the more it will shape my response. And there's a lot of concepts that are built-in assumptions about worship. For example, a lot of people assume that, that worship is just kind of an internal thought. It's a, it's a way of seeing the world. It, it, it's a, it, it's a, an insight that I hold internally. Other people wouldn't be aware of it, but, but you should know. That's not what worship is. Worship is not an invisible thing inside of you. Worship is a verb. Worship is something you do. It's an actual response. So worship is shapes what we worth, what we put value in, shapes our response. So this passage begins to deal with this because it talks about worship. And one of the first things it indicates to us, kind of surprises us, that worship is physical. Scripture reveals worship is physical. That, that there's an aspect of our responding. You see, we consider some things to be spiritual and some things to be sacred. We kind of separate our lives into two things. We, we consider a moment like this when we're all together and singing songs of, about God and, and listening to words from his word. And, and, and we consider this, this is a, a, a sacred thing. And then we go outside and, and maybe we're at a sporting event or a neighbor's house. Well, that's a, that's a secular thing. I wonder if our willingness to divide our thought process up like that doesn't actually create an environment where there could be increased disrespect. What if all of it is supposed to be sacred? Um, even our physical life. See, that's what it says. Your bodies are living sacrifices. Our everyday ordinary life, how we live it out, it matters. And th this is a really challenging idea for us to work our way through. So worship is physical. Secondly, everyone worships. Now, you might be here and go, yeah, that's, that's not true. There are lots of people that don't worship. Maybe you even think, I don't worship. Um, well, I'd like to challenge your thinking about that. Because once again, that assumption is built maybe on buying into a certain... 
faith orientation. Question, remember, worth, worth shape. What do you hold in high value and how do you respond to it? And as it turns out, every one of us holds something in high value. Every one of us responds to that. For example, let's suppose what you really find valuable is money. Money. You have a lot of value. But that, that is going to determine how you respond in a lot of things. The reason maybe you value money is because you feel a little bit more secure if you have more of it. People treat you better or differently. If you seem to have more of it, uh, you, you feel better about yourself if you have more of it. So you don't just think those thoughts. This is really interesting. You don't just think, I really like money. It, it comes out in your actions. You, you work extra hours. You worry more if you lose some of it. You become angry if someone takes some of it from you. Like, we don't do that about everything. For example, let's suppose you push a garbage down at the end of the driveway and somebody stole your garbage. Are you really angry about that? No. In fact, if they would promise to steal your garbage every week, you would cancel your service and save some money. Like, that's how you would do that. You check your financial statements more. Maybe you forego some things you would enjoy just so you can have some more resources. We can really value money, or we can value power. Maybe if I've got more influence and more control, I will feel safer. I will feel like I can control my future. I will feel like people will respond to me in a way that, that is more respectful. Uh, so then the question becomes, how do I gain more power? And you will act very consistent. If that is important to you, you will be terrifyingly consistent in pursuing more. You'll make sure you are around the right people and in the right places. You will drive to places you would not ordinarily go. You will show up early and you will stay later just in the hope that you make that connection that increases your influence. And if someone doesn't recognize the power and the influence that you have, that's going to affect your relationship with them. And if someone tries to take power from you, you will feel very threatened by that. If someone can give you more power, it's amazing how you will respond to them. What are you doing? You're worshiping. What you value is shaping your response. Or maybe it's something as simple as approval. Just you really value approval that you, you, you've you feel really good. You feel safe. You feel connected. You feel respected when people pat you on the back and tell you you, you did a good job. So now you have to act in ways to make sure you're reading the signs that they approve. And you have to ask the kind of questions that release information from them as to whether they are approving or, or don't approving. And, and, and there's, there's dozens of things like this. It can be sports. It can be education. It can be access to certain things in all kinds of ways that we express worth in something, and then it shapes our response. It's very easy to worship, by the way, all of those things and hide it behind religious symbolism and call it something else. There are people that are power, worshipers of power and worshipers of money, but they put a religious symbol over it. They're still after the same thing. They're just using the name of God to get it now. And that's a problem. So scripture reveals that everyone will worship, and scripture reveals that what you worship determines how you worship. What you worship determines how you worship. If you worship money, you just have to work harder. You have to be a little less generous. Uh, you have to keep what you've earned. You have to try to make more. Uh, that's just how it works. Uh, if, if it's power, if that's what you worship, then it's going to affect how you respond. Seeking approval is going to affect how you... The God we determine to worship determines how we worship. So here's the question I have for you. If that's true of the money God and the power God and the approval God and any other God we claim to bring into our lives, if all of those gods get to determine how we worship, why would we assume that the living God wouldn't care how we worship? Uh, by the way, this is not a style preference thing. This is not about whether you prefer more traditional hymns or you prefer contemporary songs, whether you prefer organs and pianos or you prefer electric guitars. That, that's not about it. Please understand this. Worship is not about our personal preferences. Worship is about our personal responses. It's a very different thing. 
So in the older covenant, there was a, a way that people worship. It was very detailed and, 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 and described and prescribed. Like you didn't have a lot of options on this. And in the Old Testament, there were ways that you came to worship and there were expectations. And it was very written down. If you ever want to try to figure it all out or learn it all, you can just read through the book of Leviticus. Good luck with that. Like the level of detail is mind-numbing and it's just all the things that they paid attention to. But if you came to the high priest, the very high priest's name in the Old Covenant, his name was Aaron. So let's say you came to Aaron and, and, and you're coming to worship. And, and in that system, you would bring a sacrifice. That's how it worked. So you bring a sacrifice and you come to Aaron and say, I've come to worship God today. And, and Aaron would say, that, that's wonderful. I'm so thrilled. Where's your sacrifice? And you go, no, 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 there's no sacrifice. It's just something in my heart. And Aaron would look at you and go, I'm glad there's something in your heart, but that's not all there is. Something else needs to be brought too. And like we would, if we lived in that older covenant, we would just understand that. Well, in the new covenant, the good news for us is the sacrifice is already taken care of. But we're confronted with this passage that says we bring our bodies as living sacrifices. God is not asking us to stop living for him. He's asking us to continue living for him. So if we want to experience that kind of transformation that occurs in our life, then the Bible says in that passage we have to learn to renew our minds. We have to learn to renew our minds. A lot of times we are confronted by pressures in our culture just to get us to fit in. Those are very powerful forces. Sometimes we think that peer pressure, the only people susceptible to that are in middle school and high school. I can tell you one thing right now. Everybody in this room is susceptible to peer pressure as any kid that walks into middle school. That, we are not exempt from that. And so how can we learn to be shaped by what God intends for our life and just instead of all of those things we're trying to fit in on? And this is what we need to know. Worship is the way to approve God's will. We test it and we improve it. And it's, it gives us really interesting information. It tells us that God's will is three things. It's good. That, that tells us that, that his, his will is, 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 is honorable. It's beneficial to us. It, it tells us that his will is pleasing. That means it's gratifying and satisfying. It tells us that it's perfect. It means it's complete, not lacking anything. Here's what I want you to know. We cannot discover God's will just by acting on the conforming powers of our world or the internal thoughts of our own heart. There's something else that's required, and it does take action. So today I'm putting a warning label on this message. You, you buy lots of things that have a warning label. Here's the warning label for the message today. All right. To worship God in the ways he prescribes will confront pride in your heart. To worship God in the ways he prescribes will confront pride in your heart. And when it comes to worship, there are, just some, there are some people who say this. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just not that kind of person. And that's the point. We're not. God hasn't just come to affirm who and what we are. He's come to transform who and what we are. When we approach God, he openly invites and welcomes us. And we begin to be shaped by a very different sort of influence in our life. So just like money can make you hard and demanding and power can make you ruthless and insecure and approval can make you weak and, and lose your own identity... Those things, those worship things transform your life. Worshiping the living God transforms your life too. And, he, and worship of the living God makes us more loving and more caring and more wise and more honoring and more generous. And if it's not doing those things, maybe we're worshiping something else and just adding God's name to it. Maybe that's what's happening. So as we begin to understand who God is, we begin to respond to him. So here, here's some examples. Like just a few minutes ago, we were, we were singing songs. And we, we were standing and, and we were lifting our voice, or at least a lot of us were lifting our voice. And, and here's a really remarkable thing is that when we say something that's true, something inside of us gets stronger. 
And when we say things that aren't true, something inside of us gets weaker. It's why Jesus was relentlessly ruthless about rooting out anything of deception or pretense. He was constantly pointing people towards you have to seek truth. That's what brings freedom into your life. That's what makes you strong. Not because it's easy and not because it's inexpensive, but because it's what builds you up. Other things will not. Or uh, here's uh, how many are willing to try a little experiment with me today? Okay. Not a lot. So <laughs> we'll, see. we'll see how this goes. <laughs> All right. Just so you know. We're live streaming. You're about to make me look very bad, okay? So, <clears throat> okay. So, let's suppose that we were introducing a special guest, maybe one of our missionaries. And so, I would just say, I would like you to introduce to you, and I say their name. Would you please uh, help them to feel welcome in our church family today? And we would all do what? <laughs> right. Absolutely right. All right. Or... If, if you see some people around here today that are wearing black t-shirts and it says OCM, that means that they participated in oil change ministry and they helped serve uh, all those individuals yesterday who just single parent moms and, and, and seniors on limited incomes and, and spouses of people in military. We want to make sure their cars keep running safely. So, so we, we did that. And if we wanted to express our appreciation for people who served, what would we do? We would go, yeah. That's right. You know, if, if, to show thanks or to show a welcome, we do that without thinking all the time. But if I asked us this morning to express a welcome to God or appreciation to God, some of us would have a hard time doing that for God. We'll do it for almost anyone else. Why is that? Okay. How about this? Raised hands. Does, it, does anybody live in a neighborhood where people wave at each other? It's like the first commandment of my neighborhood. You just wave. It doesn't matter whether you know them or not. Just, you, you go down the street, wave, 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 wave. When I'm driving into the neighborhood and someone is coming out, I might not be sure if they belong to our neighborhood or not, but just in case, wave, <laughs> right? It just all the time. Somebody walks by the house, we wave. It's just, it's just what we do. We, we, we wave. Or let's suppose this morning that, that I came to you and I said, um, someone has asked me to hand this off to you. It's a $100 bill here. How many of you would actually extend your hand to get it? Yeah. Some of you are going, I don't raise my hands, but I would take the money. So, Really? Are you the person that goes, just, just slide it in my pocket? You, know, just, you, you wouldn't do that. You know, you, you put your hand out. And when we come into the presence of God, maybe it's a way of acknowledging him or just receiving. What do you have for me today? Because I think your intention towards me is good, and I would be open to a gift you would offer. You know, what you're worth shapes your response. It is how it works. Uh, there's a really interesting story in 2 Samuel chapter 6. It's a story of, of the second king of Israel. His name is David. And he has the opportunity to bring the most significant piece of religious furniture to Jerusalem. It's the Ark of the Covenant. And his first effort at doing that went horribly wrong, but the second effort went really well, and he was so joyous. He was, David was a really interesting guy. He, he didn't have a lot of inhibitions. And so he just busted out in a dance that was quite the dance. Have you ever heard the phrase, you got to dance like no one is watching? Yeah. Uh, there's actually, a, it, it comes from a phrase, you got to dance like there's nobody watching, love like you've never been hurt, sing like nobody's listening, and live like it's heaven on earth. That was actually written by a public school teacher, believe it or not. And David just danced like that. And I wish I could tell you that everybody was impressed by that. It wasn't true. His wife happened to notice it from her window, and she was embarrassed by and for him. And he walked into the palace, and... She meets him with shaming language. Um, it's amazing how often people will use that to try to control the behaviors of others. And I wish I could tell you religious environments and churches are exempt from this, 
We're not. We should, we should try really hard not to do it. And the purpose of the story is not to say, well, our, all of our worship should, should be unrestrained. That's not the point. The point is, is to expose the tendency of the human heart to use shame to try to control someone else. So when you think about worship, are you the kind of person who speaks shame-filled things to yourself or thinks shame-filled things about others? Are you the kind of person that will actually allow pride and shame to dictate your options, your choices, what you will do? And are you comfortable with that? I'm going to ask our worship team to come up. And I just want to conclude with this thought today. Oddly enough, God's not exempt from this physical thing. One of the great questions that get asked of religious people like myself, someone who's considered in leadership, is, well, why did God have to send his son to pay a price for people's sins? Why couldn't he just say, hey, you're all forgiven. Wipe the slate clean. And that's a really good question. And there's a complicated series of answers, but I can say a couple things about it is, we all know what it's like to have just tried to wipe the slate, the slate clean and watch people just do the same things over and over again. If you've ever had a family member who, or a friend who's done that in your life, it, it gives rise to a kind of pain and hopelessness that's hard to imagine. Nothing seems to change. God doesn't just say, I'll, I'll wipe the slate clean. Forget about it. He doesn't do that. He sends his son in the flesh. And his son gives his actual life. So why would God do that? And it's because of what value he places on you. The worth that God thinks about you shaped an actual physical response. And he sends his one and only son. And if even God is not exempt from that, why would we be? So I'm going to ask us in just a moment to stand, and we're going to sing in response. Even if you're not used to doing it, try lifting your voice. You don't have to shout the loudest. I'm not asking for that. If there's something that you want to receive, maybe just take the body posture of saying, God, maybe, maybe you don't even know if God exists. Maybe you're still figuring that part out. Okay. Then maybe... If you're even real, I would be open to something you have for me today. That would be a remarkable thing. And you'd be surprised how much that begins to shape the person you become. Would you stand with me this morning?